It was October the 14th, 1954. Like a reptile emerging from the dust of centuries, Kolkata's buddy gun tail tram was snaking its way towards Rashbahari Avenue. A man was walking in the direction of the oncoming vehicle. He moved fast. So did the tram. Its driver clanged the bell forcefully, shouting out, but he persisted onto its path regardless and disappeared under the catcher as the brakes screamed to a halt. <laughs> My name is Jibaran on the Dutch. I live on Lansdowne Road. Of all the people who helped me on that fateful day, none knew that I had written poetry about those very tram lines from footpath to footpath in Kolkata. Footpath to footpath, like primeval serpentine systems. Tram lines are spread out under my footsteps. I woke on, feeling that poisonous make the touch and the blood coursing through my veins. It is drizzling. The heat is somewhat chill. I remember some far away grassy green land, rivers, and fireflies. Where are they now? Have they lost their way? They were unaware of Dubonanondo because at that time he was little known as a poet. It seems inconceivable that he would become one of the greatest writers Bengal has ever known. Dubonanondo Dash is a very interesting figure. In fact, I'm trying to write a book on him. Some have encountered Rabindranath Tagore, the Nobel laureate for literature, but Jibonanondo remains an obscure name to many in the West. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to write a book on him. Uh, as a matter of fact, I discovered him coincidentally through a Bengali friend. Spellbound by his writing and his life, I began to research further and finally decided to write a book on him. I had other reasons too. I will return to those later. Such an intriguing man. Why would he walk towards a slow moving tram? Were tram catches invented to drive people from the tram? Ah, oh. you modern people may not know what a tram catcher is. Well, in those days, every tram in Kolkata was fronted by one. People used to call them cow catchers. But whilst trams could fell an animal, no person had ever been struck by one. Dibonanondo was probably the first and the last in the world to suffer such a fate. Like an ancient serpent, his death is a mystery. Was it an accident? Suicide? Or was it foul play executed by many hidden players of social homicide? I don't know, but in my book, I try to weigh up the possibilities. Let her explore my life, if she so wishes. I will instead tell you something of my city wonders. I used to take myself out in the dead of night and walk from footpath to footpath. As I did so, I would drink in the sights of the city the sleeping beggars, the prostitutes awake for business, and the dance of insects in the glow of street lights. I felt as though I was crossing from one century to another as I rode in Bonolata Shen. 
For a thousand years I have walked the ways of the world, from Sinhala's sea to Malaya's in night's darkness. Ah, did I roam in Bimbisar and Ashok's ashray world was I present. And one for hours and hours before time has crept in and forced me to surrender. And I would return home, fearful of the welcome that lay within. so long. Will you hear it? No. Well, then I'll tell my captive audience. My breast is born. Can't escape. Someone has taken my hand. <coughs> All that is done means nothing. It seems nothing is there. Thought is a knot. And each moment of prayer is empty as air. Empty as air. Sitting in the midst of all, with my individual ways of being, am I alone becoming someone not my own? Are my eyes dazed alone to this perplexity of It's only my part that me. And this sensation, how many potatoes can this sensation buy? How many kilos of rice? Rice and potatoes, all there is to life, that will do. Well, without them, you won't be having any such sensations. It's been five years now since you've been in work. How do you think this family keeps going? You have barely any ambition. Who would employ such a lazy dreamer? Indeed. You don't want my ambition. You know that of me. There is more to life than this kind of material comfort. 
flailing in an office for the tape, eating whatever roots and bulbs one can scramble from the underground. Then write something people will read for goodness sake. Look at my uncle, Niharanjan Gupta. His thrillers sell like hotcakes. Ah, the popular thriller writer uncle. No one cares for your poems. They can't understand them. And your books don't sell. Maybe then they're not meant for them at all. Perhaps it is destined for the next generation. Or even the one beyond. Here you go again. What do you know about the future? Can't you focus on now? To think I knew nothing of your endeavors. They told me I was to marry a Delhi College lecturer. And so I did. A lamb to the slaughter. I was to marry an academic. Not a poet. Of course, then you went on to lose your position, and here we are, five years later. Nothing. I was in the art world as well, you know. An actress in my college days. But all I ever wanted when I married was an ordinary family life. A husband and a couple of children with whom to enjoy a simple, happy existence. I don't know who to blame anymore. You? Or me? Do you know very well that what happened at Ram Judge College is no fault of mine. It was all internal politics. I was the victim. And I've been trying to get another job ever since. Yet you don't try hard enough, Chibo. You are so consumed by your poetry <laughs> that your vision has become clouded. You fail to see the reality before you. Maybe I do. You will let no pain or straddling those two entities. How can anyone want the night ever be over? No. The night won't ever be over? Tonight will never be over. No. Winter night won't ever be over. I'll sleep. No. It won't be over. Winter night won't ever be over. I'll sleep. It won't. It won't ever be over. the great enigma of Bengali writing. The whirlpool of life has plucked the poet from Babashal, a land of green grass and rivers and butterflies, and thrown him down on the toxic tram lines of faraway Kolkata. A 
few acquaintances come to the hospital, his family too. From time to time, he wakes and utters one or two words. Once, half asleep, he wants to eat an orange. We will return to that orange later. Nurse Shanti Mukherjee wipes the sweat from Dibbalanondo's brow and tends to flowers in a vase at his bedside table. And then there is Shopana, who comes and stands morosely at his bedside, staying just a short time before returning home again. It seems she is indifferent to the incident. There is indeed an incompatibility between the two. But who is to blame? No one is at fault. Myself, I blame the torture of art. You know the truth of it. Artistic sensibility has ruined me. I find myself plagued constantly by a desire to create. Overwhelmed by eagerness, a, a thirst, a greed, intensity of life's joy and sorrow. From this kind of still new dangerous awakening. Wondering, uncharted thoughts, imaginings, dreams. The curse of the artist has sabotaged my chances of success. Life is a dark void. Bad enough for ash and dust. <laughs> We're not a poet, but a tennis player, say. So. A wonderful life things could be. No thoughts to encroach upon my existence. No sudden rush of words to strike at my heart and settle therein. Settle therein. Settle therein. Um, Encourage us, they cry. Give us our due. We are left ugly and in disarray. You are the master of order. Make us stand out. In your hands we become beautiful. What? Do you torture? Those who are afflicted know not what it does. How night after night, night be frittered in the pursuit of one perfect word among thousands. Who was to blame? Maybe it was his mother who should be held to account. Kusham Kumri Devi was herself a writer. She guided her son through calm waters to a rough, poetic sea teeming with sharks. Dibbalanda wrote of his childhood in Barishal and their family home. As a young boy, he would lie awake fighting waves of sleep as he waited for her to wrap up work for the day and come home. He described the deep content he always felt at her return, drifting off with his eyes fixed on her gleaming face as she sat to read the day's paper by the light of the oil lamp. And how as dawn came, he would awaken to the sound of her voice, catching fragments of song. He described how his mother, so adept at writing, would stir a curry with one hand whilst penning a poem with the other. One of these was the exemplary boy. When within our country will that boy be born, who not by words but by deeds grows big and strong. Smiling face, expansive chest, a mind that's full of fire. I must indeed become a man. This his firm desire. Jibadananda was Kushan Kumri's first born. Did this poem waste the hopes she had for her own son? It is true that my mother introduced me to the world of poetry. But as time went on, my creative endeavours drifted far from her own. In the end, she could no longer understand my work. 
I once wrote a poem about the rebel politician Jitaranjan Dash. Miller, I read your poem. I have to say it struck me as rather angry. Chitaranjan Dash is a respectable figure, but I ask you to consider Ram Mohan or some other sage as your subject, to write serene poetry with which to honour these great men. I replied truthfully what I felt, that I wanted in fact to drag those idolised people from their high altars and scrutinise them. Mother advised me uh, against my negative thoughts, to respect and trust not only saints, but every common man. Eventually, however, my mind unchanged. She agreed with me. Well, that's fine. Do what you must do. You know, I used to tell you a story when you were a little boy. Seeing her babies are growing and can flap their wings, the mother bird asks them, Can you fly now? The chicks reply, yes, we can. Okay, then, off you go. But be careful, says the mother bird. Milua must now tell you the same. Spread your wings, but go with caution. Frankly speaking, I've come to believe the mother was right. By now, however, I also know that the path she did best was a blink of one. Real life differs from her idealism, corrupted by malice, envy, and, and unbridled. Simply venerating, simply glorifying the venerated does not work here. That fairy tale world I grew up in ceased long ago to exist. My artistic sensibility is hardened now by the harsh realities of a life beyond. Jivadanondo reaches the depths of his artistic sensibility in the poem One Day Eight Years Ago, and exquisitely so. The word soon spread to the morgue he'd been taken, dead. Last night, in the darkness of Falcon's early spring night, when the five-day-old moon had dipped out of sight, he longed to be dead. His wife had been lying next to him, his child too. He had love and dreams. It was moonlight. Why then would some ghost haunt him? Why then could he sleep no longer? At any rate, now he sleeps soundly in the morgue. This sleep is something he wanted. Like a plague infested rat, love foaming with blood. Neck huddling in some strange darkness, he sleeps. He will never get up again. He will never get up again. He will not face any more distress. The heavy birth, deep, unceasing pain of consciousness. strange darkness close by his window some mute thing humped like a camel delivered him this message <coughs> a man has taken his own life yet his reason for doing so is unclear by the end the poet has arrived at an answer not riches nor deep nor even a life of ease. Some other beguiling disaster frolics in our blood. It wearies us. That phrase, beguiling disaster, refers to the intangible impulse of the creator, the, the restless soul that drives every artist, every poet the world over. The way Jibananondo rendered this feeling was unheard of. It wasn't just Kushan Kumari who failed to appreciate her son's novel mode of expression. 
Chibodanondo sent his first published book of works to Tagore for comment. The response he received was a cold one. Some might even have called it rude. Dear Chibodanondo, there is no doubt that you have poetic sensibility. But why this heavy handedness with language and other aspects of your writing? Such affectation can only serve to demean one's skill. A high quality composition bears the mark of tranquility, and the absence of it makes me uncertain about a work's prospects. The application of force does not convey strength, rather, quite the contrary. I deeply respect Tagore. Indeed, I have written a number of poems dedicated to him. But I doubt really if he understands my voice. I am an unknown poet from a small Mufasil town. He, a noble laureate, celebrated the world over. But that does not oblige me to accept his views. I simply don't agree. And I have told him such. The ancient Greeks, in particular, were very partial to what we may call serenity. Through much of their poetic work, their threads are stream of quiet. But there are other frequencies of expression. Where I hear these, I fail to see them as hindrance. One sees this uh, serenity in, for example, Dante's Divine Comedy, or the works of Shelley. And I've yet to receive a reply. No matter. I will keep on writing my poems in my own way, and hope that someday, somewhere, my work will find appreciation. Last night was a magical night for which he gave which today inspired me to write. I use words and images, the likes of which I believe have never been witnessed. Last night was a night of strong winds.
night. It wasn't just Tagore, though. Jibbalondo's contemporaries also failed to recognize the value of his work. Rather, they mocked him, derided him. The notorious critic, Sir Gianni Cantadash, in particular, gave him hell. Dash had a newspaper, Sani Balachiti, the Saturday Post. The moment Jibbalondo published a poem, he would ridicule it there and mercilessly so. I recall how he mocked the lines of sensation. With the eyes of love, I have looked at womankind. With the eyes of neglect, I have looked at womankind. With the eyes of hate, I have looked at womankind. The poet views the fairer sex from every perspective short of marriage. Perhaps he should have made an honest woman of someone. It would have been all the better for the poor readers. So Johnny Cantor certainly had a way with humour. In actual fact, no writer of that time understood Jibbalanondo. He was different from everyone. He didn't belong to a group, nor did he ever attempt to make connections. He was completely alone, and as such, vulnerable to attack. Is this the reason I became interested in you? I don't claim to have the same talent, nowhere near. Our literary worlds are anyway far apart. Yet, I somehow feel connected to him. Not just as a reader, as a writer too. I, I understand his loneliness. I'm no stranger to being ignored. Forgive me, I have not come here to talk about myself. I sometimes think to challenge Shantani Konto, but I always decide in doing so. What use would it be? If my poems last, then that alone would be proof of their work. It is wrong, though. Of course, there is another who is always baffled in my corner. Buddha de Post. Once, he published a piece detailing a single line which he likened to a Browning's everlasting wash of air. The sky unfurled in its barren blue, sky upon sky. He appreciated how an infinite image could be portrayed so succinctly, coined it in his own way a magic line. He, he observed how the use of the repetition of the word sky gave the image of energy, made it utterly alive. I am happy that my poems resonate in at least one person's mind. Of course, there is another chink of light in this wretched existence. My cousin, Shubhana, to whom I dedicated my first book of poems. Her father, my uncle, Otto Lavando, encouraged me to visit them in Asham to uh, explore business opportunities in the timber trade. I was yet unmarried, looking for work. He was a senior official in the forest department. I took him up on the suggestion, not to procure employment, but rather to spend time with his daughter.
dedicated the book to me. You were not said the ocean every way. There is no one like you. Oh, funny you are. You embarrass me, you know. Not this more emptiness. For me, no words of the sea. To quell my thirst. To quench my thirst. A tattered body and soul dripping like water. You and I say the ocean there waves. No one. No, Vilda. This is not what you're here for. Baba summoned you to look for a job. Who would spend time with those dull timber merchants? Who would time spent with you? Vilda, listen. This is not going to work. Why? They're cousin for a start. Our religion won't allow us to marry. I don't give a damn about religion. Not if you are with me, Shabuna. Don't talk nonsense, Vilda. Even if it was possible, you haven't figured out what to do with your life. You cannot live on points, you know. I will find something. I will look for something, Shubhana. Isn't that loud enough to know? Who told you I'm thinking of love, marriage, or any such thing? I am trying for the best college in culture. Remember? They don't even consider me without the place. On such a wonderful day, the sky will return, it seems, its debt to the earth. Remember those lakes of Tagore? They may not like all his works, the songs On such a day, one ought to speak one's heart. And here you are talking about your braids, Shogunar. That's enough now. I must go and say, you stay with your life. Oh, I know you're discouraged. You invested for greatness. The star. But me? I am not a nobody. I can never hope to reach such heights. some country path. I find you once again. Tibor Nondo harbored this love for Shobana all his life, even after his marriage to Labonna. But feeling was never reciprocated. His conjugal life, meanwhile, remained hostile, made worse by his unemployment. 
And so it was that he took the decision to go to Kolkata in search of a job. There he found accommodation in a nest and survived on meagre tuition work. Jibun Nondo wrote diaries. His account of that period of unemployment is gut-wrenching. He, he talks of wandering from door to door like an animal looking for work. How back at the nest, he survived only on okra. <laughs> he writes dryly about those okra though, describing the irony and the beauty of the vegetable. <laughs> I remember similar times myself. Back when I was writing my first book of poems, I would spend all day in cafes nursing a single black coffee and biscuit. <laughs> Living on the little welfare money I had, there was no choice but to save energy. I poured my heart into that book. Hardly anyone noticed it. For who in the world would care what I think and feel about life? I'm no stranger to systematic exclusion. Anyway, I digress once more. Let me return to Jibon Rondo. This is his story. During his Kolkata days, he had so little money that he couldn't even afford to drink tea. Pointsman, typist, he just needed some position somewhere. He describes himself as a, a wallowing pig. We're talking about 1930s colonial India. It was a time of economic depression. There was very little work for an educated person. But it is my belief that as difficult as it was to gain employment, Jivananda would have liked it even less had he done so. Work meant servitude. And that was not something to which he was amenable. At the same time, a wider crisis was afoot. The outbreak of the Second World War in Europe. India, too, was propelled into chaos and fear. One poor death. An alarm sounds another. I had thought the humans would have progressed steadily in history's lap. Instead of playing with the machines they had mastered, they would have matured with accumulated successes. But it is the machine that has become the power to reckon with. It is love that has been functioning. Power prospered with a nuclear bomb. Was the increase in knowledge supposed to result in such a split? After the war was over, the British left India, but before they did, they dispatched one Sir Radcliffe from England to Delhi to carve the boundaries of two new countries. Radcliffe sketched his outlines in pencil upon a map. Pakistan for the Muslims, India for the Hindus and the Sikhs. As simple as that. And so began the riots and the bloodshed. Hindus killing Muslims and Muslims killing Hindus. Meanwhile, Jivananondo returned from Kolkata to Barishal. Violent riots had erupted in East Bengal, most notably in Noakali, where Gandhi himself went to try and restore the peace. There were rumours that Thousands of Bihari Muslims were entering East Bengal and going directly to Barishal, where they planned to drive out the local Hindu population. We must leave Barishal immediately and go to Kolkata. What will be our fate? Kolkata is not safe either. Haven't you seen the pictures in the newspapers? The one with all the bodies. Well, where would we stay there? Our children cannot live in the mess. 
For the time being, we can lodge with Ashok Dan. Ashok's flat is fine. How will he accommodate us? I have no job, remember? We'll stay there temporarily. I have a college degree. I will find something. There is no work for women, but there is no work for women here, but there will be in Kolkata. You can continue with your house tutoring, and we'll be able to rent a small place. If we stay here, we will be killed. You understand that, Jibon, don't you? I do. We have to leave soon. Tomorrow, if possible. I will start packing. The Lord knows what we will be able to take. If nothing else, I need that black trunk. Which trunk? The one underneath our bed. What? It contains my unpublished manuscripts. They may all be lost. You and your wretched manuscripts? Do you think of nothing else? So it was. And I was forced to depart the rivers, earth, and shelter of the land where I was raised and born. As I bid my goodbye, I just spoke to you. Let me ask for the tree slowly. Which way are you headed? Where do you want to go? We've all been neighbors. For so long and so very close. Your son stay straw up for standing yet. And here you go, for staking, land and home. Everywhere. Not far. I have no idea. You packed up your belonging, even the broken bones, that leaky pot. Now where are you set on going? won't stay any longer. Which way are you headed? I suppose the greater peace somewhere else. More hope. The deeper sense of life, I suppose. And that's why you go there to build your huts of hope. No matter where you go. I could search the head shape. No matter where you build your hope filled hearts, a tale of dream, a tale of hunger, a tale of pain and separation shall show itself to brain air. So said that hush of a dream. Trembling in the darkness of the head. The black trunk of which Givodananda spoke was unearthed after his death. It contained extraordinary treasures, countless manuscripts, 2,000 poems, 150 stories, 25 novels, and nearly 4,000 pages of diary entries. Chibonanando never published any of these works. He seemed simply to want to preserve them. You may ask why. No one could say with certainty, but the discovery has allowed us to see him in a new light, as a storyteller and a novelist, as well as a During the darkest stages of his life, Jibbananda found poetry writing impossible. Instead, he put his mind to literature, to which he applied himself relentlessly. In one short story, Jamal Tuller, his male narrator, 
state of following. Man cannot live by rice alone. Yes, he may survive on cheap edibles, but to breathe? Well, that requires thought and imagination. Oh, he may discover a golden line in the western cloud, or hear the murmurs of an invisible sea, or even come upon the stunning beauty of a demigoddess, illuminated by the shimmering rays of dawn. Tibananondo had received so many blows in his romantic life, his marriage, with the reception to his writing and in his attempts to procure work. And then had come the final blow, having to leave his own country. At this point, I should remind you of the impending tram accident and my hypothesis. By now, Jibbananondo had just one joy left in the world. Memories of his beloved Bangladesh, which he could gain respite from this relentless misfortune. Once again, I'll come to the Danshi banks, to this bingo. Not as a man, but a shallot bird, or a white hawk, as perhaps a crow of dawn. In this land, you autumn's rice harvest. I'll float on the breast of fog. I'll float on the breast of fog in the shade of a jackfruit tree. Or become the pet of a teenage girl. Ankle bells upon reddened feet. I'll float the whole day long on duck meat scented waters, once again smitten by the river's fields of this Bengal to its green and kindly land, moistened by the waves of the jungle. Perhaps you'll gaze at us. Soaring upon sunset breezes. Perhaps you hear the spotted owl screeching from a shimmer tree branch. Perhaps a child is strewing puffed rice on the grass of some homes in a courtyard. But on the roof sugar those milky waters. A child, perhaps, a youth. Sailing with its dinghy, with its torn white sail. Reddish clouds scud by through the darkness swimming. To their homes, you spot white elements. It's their crowd. It's where you'll find me. Oh, I, I long to plant my feet in the soil of my Bangladesh. Not as a shallow bird of the kite, but as a humble man. But I know this is something that will never come to pass. I need a thing they call a visa. Something that they will not grant, which is the land of Muslims now. Instead, I am I'm doomed. Doomed to suffocate, encased in this prison walls of this wretched city. My brother Ashok has indeed provided us shelter, but he is plagued with problems of his own. My mother is dying. Her every waking moment is consumed by Orisha. My relationship with Labodna is pathetic. Our two children are in constant bad health. As for my job with Swaraj, well, I may have found a job, but it's, enough, it's headed in another color. These daily newspapers have their eyes trained towards the present, 
constantly in search of fresh hot news for a minor. Focused on eternity. I cannot keep pace. I simply cannot keep pace with them. Because there is one single crumb of uh, promise amongst this wretched existence. Yes, she's happily married now in Kolkata with a family of her own. Once, during my engagement to her, own, I had uh, a chance to meet with Shobana undercover. Me, Your marriage to Lavagna isn't set in stone, you know. Are you playing with me? Do I want to marry love of The one I truly wish to have has slipped away like some graceful spun. When you leave, the way he swung with me, fly away, heading off to far away Malabar Hills, not looking back to the distant shores of the past. Don't they have doubt or be afraid? I know you will never return, though. Life's first experience of the harvest. What await now is twilight, winter, and cold drop, biting drops of tea. You ought not to get married, Linda. Not even to me. Why aren't you? You are a hurt. Not a family man. God has other plans for you. Maybe Schumann is right. That family life is not for me. And then again, Perhaps I'm not even human. I want you know this body. Joyful outlook. Did you laugh? How deep self content. I feel like fleet to so far afield to join a swarm of insects in the harsh green green. Oh, dear, my big brother, right down. I feel like building everything new. Building everything new again. Oh, no. Your work is not complete yet. Keep the jaws up. And bring me to cool, kingfishers. My pilot is trying to arrive. It's beautiful work. Strange darkness. Ended upon the world these days. Those who are completely blind claim to see the most. Those who feel no love, no affection, no pleasure and pity become crucial to controlling the world. Those who still repose their faith in man and feel even now it is natural to uphold great truths and traditions, art and meditation. Come the prey of jackals and vultures. Evening star, can you tell me what path I should take? To what home? No sign of life here, no passion in sight. My dreams and thoughts forgotten. Will I find peace? 
Night Star, can you tell me what path I should take? Are you all right? What do you mean? There was an accident on the avenue. A tram hit someone. People were rushing. Come on in it. Anyone had gone out. It's a shock game. Who would go out at this hour? Everyone is fine. Get in. country will that boy be born, who not by words but by deeds grows big and strong. Smiling face, expansive chest, but mind that's full of fire. I must indeed become a man, this his firm desire. Mama! Mama! I'm not your exemplary boy, Mama. I'm not. I'm a hopelessly outdated man in a new century underneath the stars. The emergency ward is overrun with patients. Some are bellowing while others wimp with pain or gasp for breath. In one corner of the room, the patient has passed away body yet to be removed. In a few days, fraught with the oscillation of hope and despair, Jivanondo dies on that same ward, in that same discoloured iron bed, against the backdrop of those same whimpering patients. Jibanonondo may have bequeathed great treasures to Bengali literature, but what has he left for me? in my book. Please join me on my expedition. I appreciate your interest in the circumstances of my death. carry on with your exploration. It's just, if I may, I wish to tell you something. As I lay in hospital, staving off the clutches of death, a 
struggle with it. But the desire is to knowledge. And then I recall that I had once written a poem about that very orange. Here, let me recite it to you, lest it be of use on your voyage. When once I leave this body, shall I come back to this world? If only I might return on a winter evening, taking on ash, flesh, orange at the bedside.